Good, all right, so I'll start with my talk. So I'll try to give you an overview first uh, over the Weimar crisis and then relate this to the responses by Schmidt, Helsen, Kelsen and Heller to this crisis and especially to the July 1932 situation. So my talk is divided into the, these two parts. First, a general introduction into Weimar, into the political and uh, legal problems of Weimar, and then I'll be looking at these three thinkers. So I'll make a short break after the Weimar introduction. If there are any questions, I can take them. My approach is following what Dysonhaus himself calls the integrative jurisprudence approach, which combines history with politics and morality, or if you want normativity, normative questions. Okay, so the Weimar crisis, the question that I'm most concerned with, of course, is how was it possible? How was this disaster possible that a, a liberal constitutional state could veer towards authoritarianism and finally collapse into the dictatorship of um, Hitler? So what led from Weimar to Hitler is the question here. Now, there are several possible answers to this question. Many of them have been debated in the literature. I just want to remind you of a few of them. First of all, the fact that there was a very weak German tradition of democracy to begin with. We had the, the liberal constitution of Weimar only uh, arising in July 1919, so after the First World War. Before that, we had monarchy, of course, with the omnipotent Kaiser. Secondly, Weimar was from the very beginning fragmented and undermined by various illiberal forces from the left and from the right. We had, of course, on the left, the Marxists. They were mostly inspired by the Soviet Revolution, and there were, in fact, right after the First World War, early attempts at revolution, communist revolution in Weimar. In November 1918, in Munich and Berlin, we had such attempts. They were uh, thwarted, but in any case, they existed. On the right, of the other hand, we had, first of all, the elites of the old Kaiserreich, so we had, uh, we had the Junkers, the landed aristocracy, the industrialists, the state employees, the judges, extremely important. All these people fearing for their privileges with the emergence of Weimar. And on the other hand, within the right, even more, more important uh, and more dangerous enemies of the Republic, the disenchanted members of the army, of the disbanded army, armed militias, the Fry Corps, we had the Kapp Putsch in 1920, the very first vestiges of the, the coming um, uh, disaster. And of course, within this context of the, of the disillusioned uh, army, army, parts of the army, the Nazi movement emerged. To give you just some promin uh, one prominent example, uh, Reinhard Heydrich one, was one such disenchanted member, but Hitler himself, of course, was another one. So by 1932, this development coming from the right uh, and from the left led to the fact that we had very strong enemies of the Republic and they had a majority in the Reichstag. Another factor for the collapse of Weimar was the burden of the war reparations uh, imposed by the Western Allies, France and England in particular, the Treaty of Versailles is what determined this. There were initially indefinite payments by the Weimar Republic to be made, which only by the Young Plan in 1980, sorry, by the Young Plan was modified to be, the payments to be ending in 1988. Uh, another factor, of course, was then the economic crisis from 1930 onwards or if you want the Wall Street crash from 1929 onwards, that led to high inflation and unemployment. The hardest hit country was Germany together with the United States because of American investments in Germany. Another factor for the collapse was the nefarious role of various individuals 
who could have made a difference but didn't. Brüning's own problematic economic policy, deflationary policy, is being debated in the literature. Hindenburg, von Schleicher, von Papen, um, members of the high command of the army um, had, had their saying here in a negative way. And the final problem, of course, most important to us, is the weaknesses, in internal weaknesses of the Weimar Constitution. To give you some examples, the fact that a law can violate can violate the constitution. This was allowed if the law was passed by a two-thirds majority, a so-called supermajority. And another another weakness of the constitution, the fact that via proportional representation, it was sufficient to be elected into the Reichstag that left that led to very small parties being allowed to be voted into the Reichstag. Finally, last but not least, uh, the extremely powerful president, Reich president, first Ebert and then Hindenburg, uh, they were endowed with very strong powers and especially emergency powers, the Article 48, which I will be discussing shortly. So these were just some general factors which led to the collapse of Weimar. Now I will be looking in more detail at the constitutional weakness of Weimar. The immediate historical context is here, the Wall Street crash of 1929, which led to the retreat of US investments in Germany. In 1930, we get a breakout of the economic uh, crisis, unemployment rises, and the Reichstag and the president get into disagreements about the fin financing of various unemployment benefits, so very down-to-earth, immediate problem. In March 1930, the last majority coalition which was centrist and social democrats, SPD, SPD, crashes. Hindenburg nominates Brüning as the chancellor of a minority cabinet without consulting the parliament. And that's what starts the, that's what starts the, the, the whole chain of so-called presidential cabinets from 1930 to 1933. We have Brüning, Papen, Schleicher, and finally Hitler. The government, uh, in the context of these presidential cabinets, is nominated by, and it's answering directly to the president, not anymore to the parliament, and the laws, step by step, become increasingly promulgated by emergency decree. To give you an example, in 1931, 34 laws were promulgated still by the Reichstag versus 44 by emergency decree, already a majority by emergency decree, but in 1932, one, one year later, only five laws by the Reichstag versus 66 laws by emergency decree. So you can see how this led to a gradual breakup of parliamentarism. Uh, now I give you an overview of some art problematic articles from the Constitution. They are on the handout. Article 25, the president can dissolve the Reichstag but only once for the same reason, a very vague provision, which led to serious problems. New elections must be held within 60 days. Article 47, the president is the supreme commander of armed forces. Again, very problematic. 53, president nominates and dismisses the chancellor and the ministers proposed by the chancellor, which means that he could choose the government, government that suited him depending on his agenda. Article 76, paragraph 1, the Constitution may be amended by the, by the legislation. Constitutional changes become valid only if at least two-thirds of the members are present and at least two-thirds of the present members vote in favor of the amendment. And then finally, the emergency powers for the president, Article 48, the uh, the, the notorious Article 48, Paragraph 1, in the event of a state not fulfilling the duties imposed by it, so the, a land, a, a federal state is meant here, consti uh, by the Reich Constitution or by the laws of the Reich, the President of the Reich may make use of the armed forces to compel the federal state to do so. So this gives us the so-called Reich's execution. It, it gives the President competence against the federal states. 
Paragraph two, if public security or safety and order are seriously disturbed and or endangered within the German Reich, the president of the Reich may take measures necessary for their restoration, intervening if need be with the assistance of the armed forces, and he's then allowed to suspend the basic fundamental rights, the habeas corpus, the freedom of press, assembly, privacy, private property, etc. So all the liberal rights. This gave the president so-called policy, po sorry, police competencies in emergency cases. Further, paragraph three, the president of the Reich must, must inform the Reichstag without delay of all measures taken in accordance with the first two paragraphs. These measures are to be revoked on the demand of the Reichstag, so that gave the Reichstag some counterpowers, it would seem, which, uh, which um, weakened, it appears, the president's case. However, the president, um, as you have seen, had the right to revoke, the, to dissolve the Reichstag, if he so wanted. Paragraph 4, if danger is imminent, a state government may, for its own territory, take temporary measures as provided in paragraph 2. These measures are to be revoked on demand of the president of the Reich or the Reichstag. And finally, paragraph 5, details are to be determined by a law of the Reich, which was never formulated and led to the serious July 1932 problem. So note here that, this, that with these laws, we are not being given any explicit legislative powers granted to the president, so in Article 48. However, Paragraph 3 seems to imply ex negativo that we are dealing with legislative powers for the president. Why? Because in practice, in fact, that's exactly what happened. The president would transfer the powers of Article 48 to, gov to the government to pass bills. And Paragraph 3 gave the parliament revocation powers. Okay. However, by, by Article 25, the president could dissolve the parliament and because it was left undetermined what counts as an emergency in paragraph 5, after successful precedence cases, Article 48 became increasingly the norm of governing and we got into a quasi-constant permanent state of emergency. The scope of Article 48 was largely determined case by case namely by, the, by political decisions, either by the president himself or by the government, government officials who then spoke and influenced the president, or, interestingly, importantly, by judicial decisions of various courts, in particular the constitutional court, it was not called thus, it was called state, uh, Reich state court, Staatsgerichtshof, actually, but uh, the, the Constitutional Court was not the only court. There were several court, courts uh, which, were, which were allowed to, um, uh, to, to give verdicts, pass verdicts on constitutional matters. So um, the laws gu guiding the Constitutional Court, there are several of them, Article, 30, uh, sorry, Article 15, which I won't mention, but Article 19, which is important, regarding constitution, constitutional disputes within a state, the Constitutional Court, at the request of one party, decides in the name of the Reich, unless another Reich court is responsible. And in paragraph 2, the Reich president executes decisions of the Constitutional Court. This does sound as if the court had quite significant powers, if it could drive the president to execute certain kinds of decisions. The first precedence case um, which happened towards installing this, this uh, govern, governing by um, emergency decrees was in July 1913, 1930. Sorry. Parliament votes uh, with majority against a financial bill proposed by the Chancellor Brüning. It was an important law uh, in order to balance the budget deficit, but Hindenburg, disagreeing with this, transforms the bill into a law simply by announcing, I quote, based on the Article 48, Paragraph 2 of the Reichsverfassung, the following is decreed. And that was simply what, made, what gave him the legislative 
power, what made him make politics, as it were. <laughs> This was the first such degree, decree, and many more were to follow. In, by, on 18 July 1930, the Reichstag rejects the emergency decree by Hindenburg. On, as a consequence, the president dissolves simply the Reichstag. New elections are announced by Article 25, but only within 60 days, which means that the Hindenburg could simply pass his bill without a Reichstag. And the elections happened only two months later. Okay, so this was, um, first of all, some, some issues about the constitutional weaknesses. Now moving on to the July 1932 crisis, which paved the way to, for Hitler. We have a coup d'etat in Prussia. Brüning is dismissed in spring 1932 due in part to the plottings of individuals such as General von Schleicher. On 1st of June 1932, Franz von Papen, an aristocrat and military man, is appointed. Both him and Schleicher were anti-republicans. They favored a conservative dictatorship in order to defend Germany against the abuse of parliamentary democracy. They were very unhappy with parliamentarism. They wanted also to defeat the growing state socialism, what they called, and cultural Bolshevism. This was part of von Papen's government uh, proclamation, cult these terms, cultural Bolshevism and growing state socialism. In December 1932, however, Papen is replaced by Schleicher himself, for Germany needs a strong man, as he used to say, beating on, on, on his chest. In January 1933, however, immediately just a month later, Schleicher, the Schleicher government falls due to Papen's plotting, and on the uh, 30th of January 1933, you all know the story, Hitler is nominated Chancellor. Now, the long-term plan by Hindenburg, Papen and Schleicher was to end the, the Weimar Republic because it was inefficient, conflict-laden and veering to the left to replace parliamentarism with authoritarianism while at the same time avoid civil war. One handicap on the way to this authoritarianism, however, was the federal structure of the German Reich. The fact that we had a dualism between Reichs on the Reich on the, on the one hand and the federal states, the Länder on the other, Prussia in particular being the greatest federal state, taking up two-thirds of the territory of the entire German Reich, was the last bastion of democracy being ruled by a social democrat majority since 1920, so for 12 years, with Otto Braun as a prime minister. But in April 1932, uh, the social democrats lose majority, and it remains only in power as an acting government until a new government is found. There is no majority party or coalition to be found after the elections. The Nazis become the biggest minority party in Prussia, within Prussia, and together with the communists, they make over 50% of the seats. So it extremates over 50%, absolute majority. The plan then by, by uh, uh, Hindenburg and his allies was to first let the Hitler troops, the Sturmabteilung, the SA, deal with the communists, and then we shall deal with Hitler and appeal him. Um, there are parallels, I think, here to Hungary, actually, to today's Hungary. Hopefully there are no parallels, but I think that uh, we can discuss that. Um, in 1932, the Reich decree uh, lifts the ban on the Nazi param param paramilitary force on the SA, but not on the communist paramilitary forces. In other words, the Nazis are free to roam, roam the streets, but the communists are not. And, in fact, the Reich prohibits the lender, the federal states, to ban any Nazi paramilitary groups against Prussia, Prussia's will. As a consequence of this ban, in July, the tensions between the Nazis and the communists peak in street battles, and we get many casualties, especially on the so-called Bloody Sunday in Altona, a, a district of Hamburg where 18 people uh, were killed. This was on the 17th of July, 1932. 
Already three days later, von Papen had received from Hindenburg an emergency decree, decree which he essentially kept in his pocket for, the, for, for a few days. What did this emergency decree say? It deposed the Prussian government under Otto Braun, simply put. And it decreed that von Papen is to be installed as a Reich Commissar of Prussia and as a deputy of the Reich with very strong powers. The official pretext here was the inability of the Prussian government to establish security and order in Prussia, which of course was hypocritical because the Reich himself had allowed the SA troops to roam the streets. So no surprise that of course there were all the street battles. Then six days later, 20th of July 1932, after the bloody Sunday of Altona, von Papen applies the decree. The decree states, I quote, decree of the Reich president for the re-establishment of security and order in Prussia on the basis of Article 48, uh, paragraphs 1 and 2, I decree the following in order to establish public safety and order in Prussia. What does it decree? That the Prussian government is to be deposed, the fundamental rights are suspended, executive force is transformed to the Reich defense minister and thus to the Reichswehr, to the Reich's army. And thus the Prussian military apparatus is neutralized and there is no kind, uh, interesting, there was no kind of resistance. Um, now it's not that the Prussian state, federal state, had no kind of powers against. They could have opposed that even with military force because the Prussia had 90,000 police people plus there were 250,000 so-called Reichsbanner members. This was an additional um, sort of army devoted, devoted to the uh, Republic, while on the other hand we had 100,000 men of the Reichswehr, but of course we had also the SA, the, the SA troops, I don't know how many those were. So that could have led to a civil war, but not necessarily. If maybe um, <clears throat> the Prussia would have stepped up and simply threatened with military force, um, von Papen would have stepped down. In fact, from what I read, von Papen, when he handed over the decree to the Prussian officials, he was rather insecure. He was nervous and insecure. And if they had said, had said something there and then, maybe things would have been quite different. OK, Papen then in the evening declares on radio that the Prussian government was under communist influence and um, was aligned together with the communists against Hitlerism. So uh, that's why his decree, he self-justified himself, was not aimed at Prussian sovereignty. Sovereignty, rather, it was simply aimed at uh, enemies of the republic. And this decree, and uh, from, sorry, von Papen's decree, uh, was of course immediately praised by Hitler and by the right-wing Deutsche Zeitung which wrote, this ends 14 years of the nightmare of socialist and Catholic rule. So Catholicism was seen here as an enemy. Now one could of course wonder whether this was a coup d'etat. I think it's very straightforward. It was of course a coup d'etat. The allegations against Prussia were very unfair. But the deeper question which we need to discuss here is whether the emergency decree was actually constitutional, whether it was legitimate, and who, at the end of the day, was the ultimate sovereign, the guardian of the Constitution. Papen himself explained that the Prussian government could appeal to the Supreme Court in Leipzig, so he meant the Constitutional Court, and meanwhile, he continued, the signatures of the President and of myself are on the documents, so their present validity cannot be contested. So there was a small room here for the rule of law, even following von Papen's own declarations. Now, on the 21st of July 1932, Prussia indeed appeals to the Constitutional Court, not alone, together with, seconded by Bavaria and Baden, two other federal states, namely on the grounds that the presidential decree is unconstitutional, Paragraph 1 of Article 48, Prussia was fulfilling its duties. Paragraph 2, 
the president is not, was not entitled to take control of the Prussian state and suspend fundamental rights. The president has overstepped his powers and has been interve intervening on behalf of an alliance between the Reich and Nazis, and the Nazis. So he, it's not at all true that the president was here impartial. That was what the Prussian officials claimed at the Constitutional Court. Um, on the 25th of October, so much later, right, mm -hmm. while the Reich had been given all the time in the world and the Nazis to establish themselves nicely um, and take over the Prussian institutions, the Constitutional Court gives its final verdict. Here is what it says. First of all, it says the emergency decree is incorrect with respect to paragraph 1 of Article 48. The Prussian government was not, it's not true that the Prussian government was not fulfilling its duties. So Pap Papen's strong allegations were rejected. However, the court decreed that the emergency decree is constitutional with respect to Article 48, paragraph 2, appointing a Reich Chancellor to Reich Commissar of Prussia, Commissioner, Reich Commissioner of Prussia. Why? Because Germany was indeed on a verge of civil war. The alleg allegation by Prussia that the Reich had conspired with the Nazis, according to the judges, was unproven, which I find ridiculous. But even if true, the court argued, even, it's, even if it were true that the Reich had plotted with the Nazis, the decree aimed only at restoring safety and order, so it doesn't matter what the origin of the, um, of the disorder um, was, of the disorder of safety and, and order was, as long as paragraph 2 uh, was the one to be applied in, this, in such cases. In addition, the scope of the discretion of the decree was determined by the president alone, the court argued, and not by the court. And only the chancellor was answerable to the president, so Papen had, had acted in a correct way. And finally, Prussia was given some sort of rights, namely, it was said by the court that Prussia was entitled to be represented at the federal level, although as a... Uh, most observers admitted that meant simply nothing. It just meant that there were some guys who were sitting in the in the in the Reichsrat. Uh, that's all. Good. By October uh, by October 1932, of course, the Nazis had become very strong. In the elections uh, at the end of July, they had already gained 37 percent of the votes, and the democratic institutions of Prussia had been undermined by the ongoing rule of the decree, of the emergency decree, thus paving the way to Hitler's takeover in January 1933. So this was the first part, the overview over the Nazi, the Weimar part. Do you have any questions? Yes, thank you.